Let's take our Bible and turn to the book of Genesis chapter 45 together. The book of Genesis chapter 45. This evening we'd like to begin in a little mini-series of messages as the Lord will allow us continuance. We want to call it Revive, Strive, and Thrive. Revive, Strive, and Thrive. The Lord first gave me some of these thoughts when I was up in Alaska and specifically for one of the churches I preached at, at Bible Baptist Church in Chugiak, Alaska. I'm very thankful for how the Lord used them there. And as in prayer, the Lord is directed for us as well. And as we think about the topic of revive tonight, we're going to read through Genesis chapter 45, beginning in verse 25, ending in verse 28, to understand the need for being revived. It says in verse 25, And they went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father. Stop right there and understand that these are the brothers of Joseph, having just been with Joseph, and now they're coming back to their father Jacob, and they're going to tell Jacob, their father, that Joseph is alive. In verse 26, and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father, say that word with me, revived. The word revived has the idea of to make alive. Somebody has said that spiritually we understand that revival is a fresh breath of air. It is returning to that normal Christian walk that you and I ought to have in thriving in our relationship with Him. And so as we look at Jacob reviving, he's coming from a point where he had fainted. His heart fainted. His heart had grown weak with some of the news that was being shared with him. And maybe tonight you've come into this place and maybe there's a little weakness. Maybe there's a little faintness. Maybe everything's right where it needs to be. But as we think about this topic of revive, it would be my prayer tonight that we would be a people who have a spiritual revival within. We need it. We should pray for it and seek it. Let's ask God for this right now before we get into the meat of the message. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, as we think about this word revive, to make alive, to live, I pray that in our Christian life, that there would not be death, that we would not be dead. But I pray that as we have been created in Christ Jesus, that as you have given us life more abundant, that we would be the most alive spiritually that we have ever been as we move forward in our walk with you. I pray that tonight you would convict us in the areas of our life where conviction is necessary, but maybe it's a challenge that is needed. And I pray that tonight the challenge would be accepted. But most of all, I pray that we would be changed. Lord, no doubt there's people in this room that are at different walks with you. Different points in their walk. And I would pray that wherever it's at, that you would capture the heart, captivate it, and draw it close. But then maybe, Lord, there's somebody here who does not know you as Savior. I would pray that they would understand their greatest need tonight is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Through you. I pray, Lord, that you would do this work in their heart as only you can. And we'll thank you for what's said and done. And we pray it in Jesus' name that all God's people prayed and said, Amen. Amen. It is my hope and my desire tonight that regardless of everything else that is going on outside of these four walls, that we would understand that the most important thing that takes place in our heart right now is to be revived. That we would have that fresh breath of air, that the things of God would be the most exciting that's going on right now. That it wouldn't be our attention 
attention captured by something that's driven of the flesh or driven of worldly philosophy or God forbid that it would be something that even is devilish or devil-like but that we would come to a point where spiritually speaking we are revived within and that God is in control. Number one tonight I want to show you first of all that God was working. Look back at verse 26 with me. The sons come to Jacob and told him saying Joseph is yet alive. He is governor over all the land of Egypt and Jacob's heart fainted for he believed them not. And in this very first point I want you to get thinking in this direction that God was working even when people were least expecting it. Let's think about the life of Joseph for just a second and relate it to ours and our situations. Letter A, God was working wonders in spite of painful treatment by family. If you think back to that day where Joseph's brothers were so cruel and threw Joseph into that pit having done so many terrible things to their brother and even contemplate and take in his life we can look at the story of Joseph and we can understand that God was working in spite of painful treatment from family and maybe you're listening today and maybe you're going through such a trial and the trial is your own family and your own blood is treating you so painfully and causing you agony with can I share with you that in the very moment of times like that that God is not uh, uh, disappearing from your life God hasn't removed himself from your life God hasn't taken himself away he is very much at work even with the pain that you are facing from someone within your own family Joseph's life would teach us that God was working wonders in spite of trainful, tr uh, painful treatment by family. This would speak volumes to the one who has gone into and had situations of molestation and rape. This would speak to the one who has had the acts of hatred dictated toward them in their life. This would speak to the one whose family is taken and stolen from them. And in your life you are facing the pain of some Somebody who ought not do something to you and like that etc etc you can understand when you've had painful treatment by family don't let it take your mind off of God and let it like Joseph cause you to make a move to God because even though you're facing pain from family God is still working can I say this letter B God was working wonders through punishment of false accusation through punishment of false accusation before church tonight we were talking about some things and the word false accusation came up and where people make a statement about you or a statement about your workplace that isn't exactly true this is something that Joseph knew all about here is Joseph and he's caught in Potiphar's house by Potiphar's wife and Potiphar his wife was wanting to lay with him but the Bible tells us that Joseph refused listen men we are talking about somebody that obviously had some looks to him somebody that maybe even had some personality that was a whole lot better than her husband's and when husband was gone Potiphar's wife looked to do something with Joseph but Joseph was such a man of integrity that he left that situation but if you remember the story you remember Remember that Jacob or Joseph's coat was left in the hands of Potiphar's wife and when the husband came home she goes to her husband and says this is what Joseph tried to do to me which was the furthest thing from the truth and can I stop right there and just remind us in this message tonight that there might be some things that you are going through maybe punishment uh, by false accusation or maybe painful treatment by family let's understand that God is still 
still working. God hasn't disappeared from your scenario. God hasn't removed himself from the equation. God, in fact, might be trying to work something bigger and greater through you than you could ever fathom or put together in your mind. Now, I am not at all suggesting that this pastor wants to go through moments of false accusation. Amen. I am not at all suggesting that, that I am wanting you to go through something like this in your workplace or in your position where you serve and what you do. But let me just remind you that like Joseph, when you face painful treatment by family and when you face false accusations, I mean legitimate, I didn't do it. I don't know why they're saying this about me. Let us understand something. God is at work. Can I remind you that no matter the size of the congregation, no matter how much excitement is going on in the services, no matter how large or how low the offerings have been, can I remind you that God is still at work at Crossroads Baptist Church, at churches all across America? Can I remind you that not all times will you be able to look at the situation and say it's evident, but you might look at a situation and say God is so far away from this right now, but it could be so contrary to what is actually taking place. God may be building something that is so much bigger than we could ever comprehend, than we could ever think. So God was working wonders in spite of painful treatment by family. God was working wonders through punishment of false accusation. But then when I think of Joseph's life, I think, let her see, that God was working wonders as power was established that family was not aware of. As you look at verse 26 again, these brothers and the sons of Jacob told their father, saying, Joseph is yet alive. And then get this, he is governor over all the land of Egypt. Now, Jacob didn't believe them right away, but understand something from those verses there. Without having to look back or read, here's what you understand. Jacob thought his son was dead, but now in all this time, he is being told when he thought his son was dead, God was raising up his son to a position of power. Friends, we look at the fact that he suffered pain by family. We look at the fact that he suffered punishment through false accusation, but through it all, power was being established in and through Joseph that the family wasn't aware of. The others that we read about were not aware of. And we, when we go through these situations of life, we may not understand what God is doing right now. We may not realize what God has years down the road. We can't put a timetable to God, but God has it set up and ordained. We don't know what's coming in the future but what we can rest assured in is that God is establishing authority God is establishing power God is raising up people who will serve him that he can put into authority regardless of how things are in the government in America regardless of what's going on in China right now God is raising up people for his name's sake that can get the glory to give the glory to God I can rest assured that whether it's prosperity or whether it's times of spiritual famine, whether it's captive by the enemy land, you can look in the Bible and recognize that God loves to put people in authority who honor Him, love Him, and adore Him. It may not come in our time, but let us recognize that God was working in spite of painful treatment of family. God was working even when there was punishment through false accusation. And and God was working to establish power even if nobody else knew it or not. Point in case, isn't it amazing for those who were here when I was a kid, when you think back on those days when little Justin came to church at 12 years old, you would have never imagined that, that he would be standing behind the pulpit as a pastor. It was the furthest thing from my mind. I'm sure it was the furthest thing from your mind as well. But in between everything and during everything, this is what God is doing. And can I say, hey, I'm going to go ahead and say it, that it could be that God's doing the exact same thing right now and we don't even know what's going on. 
See, God is not limited by time. Sometimes we think He is. But let us understand, whatever God is going to receive is going to be the glory. And let's give God the glory the best way that God is worthy of. And if God is going to set somebody in position that is young to give Him the glory, then so be it. If God wants to remove a pastor of 33 years old and put somebody else behind this pulpit that's 83 to get the most glory from Crossroads Baptist Church, I'll go ahead and say He can do it. Let's just understand that in this place, God can do whatever God wants to do. I know that I'm not guaranteed tomorrow, and you're not guaranteed tomorrow either. Let's understand that though we're not guaranteed tomorrow, God is at work in spite of our frailties, in spite of what we cannot accomplish, in spite of our weakness. God is doing some things that only God can do. Here's what part we need to play. Like Joseph, Lord, I'm just a vessel. I'm not here to pick apart the situations. I'm not here to say, bless God, I was picked on. I'm not here to say, woe is me, I'm in the midst of this, where are you God? I'm not here to question God, I am here to say yes Lord to your will and to your way. To be most like Jesus might be to come to the point where we pray, nevertheless, thy will be done and thy will be done. I can go to the prison like Joseph, thy will be done, I can be falsely accused, thy will be done, I can face painful treatment by family, thy Thy will be done. I can be forgotten in prison for years. Thy will be done as long as you get the glory, God. I'm not here to complain. I'm not here to murmur. I'm not here to backbite. I'm not here to tuck my tail and run. I'm here to stay faithful because, God, I know that while it may seem that nothing's going on, you are at work. And Church of Jesus Christ, today as we think about the topic of revival, we can look across our nation and say, God, where are you at? You can hear the stories of vandalism and the stories of murder and the stories of painful agonies that happen in this world. And you might start to question, where is God and why is this happening? But can I remind you that God still owns the cattle on a thousand hills? Can I remind you that God still holds the heavens in the span and palm of his hand. Can I remind you that the same God that created everything that is is a God that can do anything but fail. Can I remind you that when it seems the darkest and seems the bleakest those are prime opportunities for God to show up and God to show out that he is still the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let me move on to say this number two, Joseph was willing God was working, but Joseph was willing. You know, when I think about Joseph, I think about that little, that little uh, plaque thing that my uh, mother had uh, at the house there and, and that was the, the serenity prayer. The first part of the serenity prayer says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. And when I thought about that prayer, regardless of where you got that prayer, where you heard that prayer, and what you think about that prayer, when you think about the words of that prayer, I think about Joseph and the situations of his life. Where he could be at peace. In those moments of times where he couldn't change a thing about them. Where in prison when he was forgotten and somebody else was set free. He obviously had enough to let it go. And then begin to serve within that prison and be used of God. And maybe just maybe today we need to come to grips with the reality of the willingness of Joseph. That we can say Lord I need the serenity. I need the peace to accept the things that I cannot change. And then, Lord, if you ever give me something I can, I want to have the courage to change things. Like when the man in the land came and said, You, sir, are full of wisdom. You are a spirit-filled man. Joseph, what do you think that we need to do? And here's a man that's brought before the most powerful man in all the world at that time. And Joseph needed courage to be able to say what needed to be said. And maybe just maybe. 
maybe you'll be willing today in whatever area God brings you to to not only accept the things you can't change but to be able to have the courage to change the things that you can. God may not always have you be quiet. God may put you in a position to see things change for His glory. Uh, you've heard of Jimmy Dean maybe, the actor, singer, and yes, Jimmy Dean Sausage. He made this statement, I can't change the wind. He grew up in a Baptist church. There may not be some things about him that you agree with. But he said, I can't change the wind, but I can adjust my sails to reach my destination. And I think about this in the Christian life that Joseph, this wasn't the plan that he had for his life. Oh, I got it. This is what I want to do for college. And at that age, I want my brothers to capture me. I want them to take that coat that they covet. And I want it to make it look like I was killed. I want to be thrown in a pit. I want to be sold into slavery. And that wasn't on his agenda. That wasn't what he was looking for. Then the whole Potiphar's house thing, the next prison scenario. I mean, he probably wouldn't have even thought or presumed that he would be second in command in the kingdom. But can I tell you that when Joseph found himself in a place, though he was human like you and like me, you can understand he had emotions, he felt pain, he felt sorrow, he felt defeat. But at the same time, he knew how to throw up that sail in the wind and change direction that he could start still reach that destination for the glory of God where he could find himself in a place where he was giving God the most glory. Listen, for Joseph, you might be able to say it like this. Whether it was in the pit, in Potiphar's house, in prison, or a prince underneath the number one man, you can say he was a man that in any situation, I want to glorify God. Otherwise, God may not have used Joseph the way that he did. We need to be able to look at it and say, Lord, if you have me as an ice cream engineer right now at Dairy Queen, I'm okay with that. I can be content if this is your will. But God, when you bring me to another location and another place, I want to be content to give you the glory wherever I am at. You see, number one, God was working. Number two, Joseph was willing. And as we talk about this topic called revive, to make alive, to live, I want to go to number three, Jacob was wise. I want to show you what I mean, and I want you to join me with letter A, he heard something ridiculous. Look at verse 26, and they told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive. He is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. Dads, put yourself in these shoes for just a second. And just imagine that you've lived your whole life. You're a grandpa now, a great grandpa. Uh, You're in the place where, you know what, you're looking to leave this world and your sons come to you and tell you that one of their others, his other sons, is still alive. And you're thinking, this is some ridiculous news. This is crazy. I don't know how to accept it. And listen, sometimes in our life, we're going to hear something ridiculous. Sometimes in our life, it may be that God is moving us to do something that is a step of faith. And to the carnal man, the fleshly man, it's going to seem kind of ridiculous to accept something like that. But as we look into the eyes of faith, we are going to see what really began to change some things. Let her be uh, the ridiculous term to the facts. I don't know if you remember Brother Potts preaching on this and leading up to this statement, but here's what we read in verse 27. And they told him, uh, the boys told their father, all the words of Joseph which he had said unto them. And here's the phrase, when he saw the what? The wagons. When he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. So here you have two different things. You have uh, the fact of the words of Joseph and the fact of the eyesight, the wagons, the possessions that the boys did not have enough money to purchase and to bring back. This was a whole lot more than they could afford. Their father knew it. It was a kingly type of train that was coming down the 
driveway that day. And here's what I say. I say the ridiculous turn to the facts. And maybe you're here tonight and maybe you're saying to believe the Bible is ridiculous. To believe in Jesus is ridiculous. Or maybe as a Christian there's some step of faith where you say that's just ridiculous. Well get the facts. And when you understand the facts and when God opens your eyes to the facts then that changes things. It turns to let her see the facts lead to faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It says in verse 27, they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons, which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. At the end of verse 26, when his heart fainted, he believed him not. But in verse 27, he revived. In verse 28, Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. The facts led to faith. And maybe today as a person sitting in Crossroads Baptist Church, you once looked at the things of Christianity as ridiculous. But the more God kept getting a hold of your heart, the more you were shown of the fact that God is. The fact that Jesus saves, which led to faith in Jesus Christ, which now leads you as a Christian Christian to make some decisions for the faith that you once mocked at, that you once laughed at, that you once thought was a shameful way of living. But now your spirit is truly alive. Now there's revival. Now you see things as God has them to be seen. Which letter D, the faith led to feelings. Notice a little bit of this in verse number 27 at the end. The spirit of Jacob their father revived and Israel said it is enough. My son is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. Could you imagine as a father the emotions of thinking my son's been dead this long. At least I thought he's been dead and now he's alive. I've missed out on so much. Oh I wonder if I have grandchildren. I wonder what is going on in Joseph life right now. I've heard he's the governor of the land. I realize that the reason why we are alive right now is because of his authority and his wisdom but I wonder and all of the emotions and all of the missed years and all of the opportunity is overwhelming him at this particular time. Sometimes in the Christian life the faith leads to feelings. David said it like this bless the Lord O my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name he daily loadeth me with benefits what shall I render what shall I give what shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits toward me I will sing unto the Lord I will give praise to the Lord you see the Bible is full of people who express emotion and express feeling for the faith that they possess with inside of them and it's a tall or it's a tale of revival when somebody is expressing genuine feeling for the faith, from a smile to laughter to true joy in your heart over what God is doing in somebody's life. When was the last time you cared that you heard of somebody getting saved? When was the last time that you cared that a missionary established a church in a foreign country where there hasn't been a church before in that particular village? When was the last time there was excitement over your soul because you knew that this is a prayer that you've been praying. This is an answer for you and you've been asking God and God saw fit to answer your prayer and now there's feelings and emotions that are overwhelming you because of the faith that you placed in the fact of the, that God is good and that his word is true and now you just have to express the fact that you believe that God did this for you faith led to feelings but in letter a or letter e the feelings led to restoring a long lost fellowship at the end of verse 28 let's read the whole verse Israel said it is enough Joseph my son is yet alive notice these words I What's the next word? Will. I will go and see him before I die. 
Jacob is saying, I, I, don't, I realize I don't have much time and I realize that I've missed out on so much time because of what my other sons did to Joseph and I need to go restore this fellowship. He said, it is enough. I need to go reconcile, restore, get together with, revive that relationship. Before I die, I need to see it through. I want to lay eyes on my son. I want to hug him. I want to kiss him. I want to let him know I love him. I haven't been able to say that. Maybe it's been some time since your spirit's been revived before God. And you need to come to a point where you realize there's been a a broken connection, a disconnect between you and God. And maybe you've understood it, but maybe you really cared less about that connection being made. Oh, I was telling my brother a little bit earlier today that one of my friends from Pensacola who travels in evangelism now, his name is Adrian Burden. Uh, he was in the Carolinas for the hurricane and their, their trailer made it through okay. They had some leaks. But he posted a map of the Carolinas where they were traveling from point A to point B. And if you'd look at that, you would think that you're going to expect a wiggle worm down to the city that they were going. But that wiggle worm was interrupted several times with branches that then branched off again. And what was supposed to take him five hours took him 11 hours to get to. He said, we're driving through, we can't go that way, so we got to turn around and go back and find another road to try to make it somewhere. And then we're driving past grocery stores where people are banging on the grocery door because they need some food. And we're driving down the road and we see that these power lines are disconnected from the storm and there's thousands and more people out of power and they're waiting for uh, the emergency crews to come in and to clean things up and to fix things so they can get back to a normal way of living again. They want the connections that they've only been missing for a short time to be reestablished. I need food. I need water. I want power, electricity to my home again. Maybe I want my home. I want to get back in it. Maybe taking for granted some of the things that they had just lost. It's a good place in our spiritual life when we realize there's been a disconnect and we want it fixed again. We want everything back with, with God where it needs to be. Here's the phrase I want to leave you with that Jacob said in verse 28. Jacob, Israel, same thing. And Israel said, say the next three words with me, it is enough. In essence, for our Christian life today, it's enough of this separation from God. It's enough that I haven't been in the Word. I need to get back to it. It's enough that I haven't cared for the things of God the way I should. It's enough. And I want to get a beeline to where I need to be with God. Therefore, I want my spirit to be revived and I want to put feet to what I need to do to see to it that connection is reestablished between me and God. The first message in our mini-series is revive. Strive is next. And then thrive. May we be a people who seek to be revived, even right now, tonight, in some area of our life that's lacking before God. Let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, as we bow before you this evening, we thank you for the power of the Word of God in our lives. We thank you for the Word. And now maybe somebody here needs to see the wagons, kind of like Jacob mentioned. Uh, Lord, I pray that we would see those facts that point us to the faith, that then bring about the feelings, that we see the disconnect, and we want to reconnect that lost fellowship, and we get back to what that life in Christ is all about. Lord, maybe there's somebody here tonight that doesn't truly know you as Savior. I pray that they'd understand it's not a reconnect. They just need connection in the first place. They need your son, Jesus. Help them to see that more and more understanding it's the goodness of you that leads them to repentance.